Why, hello! Now, would you like some absolutely fantastic, realistic paws for yourself that look just like these? You can make them, and I'm going to show you how. They have phenomenal dexterity, wonderful clickety-clacks, and absolutely beautiful little beans. And it's actually a lot easier than you think. Let's go ahead and get into it. The pattern for these is going to be available on my website, artbynefertiti.com store, and you can also find it linked down in the description. Now before we begin, these paws are incredibly slim fit, so be sure you reference the guide on screen or in the download when you purchase these on my website, because there are very precise measurements you're going to need to take note of in order to begin with this pattern. If for whatever reason your measurements are off from the base pattern that you can see, you will need to make according edits to make the whole pattern fit onto your hand. Because this is a slim anthro styled paw, it's designed to be very realistic and form fitting. Therefore, it is a very precise and snug fit, so you are going to have to learn how to operate with measurements on this pattern. If this is something that's a little bit outside your comfort range, I suggest sticking with something a little bit easier, such as a puffy paw pattern instead, that's a little bit more forgiving. This pattern will require you to measure the length of your forearm, your palm, your fingers, as well as the circumference of your forearm in multiple locations, and the circumference of your fingers. If these do not match with the base pattern, you are going to have to expand it and edit it accordingly, which isn't too hard. Next, we move into materials. All the furs I'll be using are from howlfabrics.com, my preferred shop for any kind of fantastic luxury furs. And then we're going to be transferring all the patterns onto our fabric. For this particular pattern, I only use about one fourth of an inch of seam allowance, so it's a very teeny tiny amount. And I'm actually tracing my patterns using a wax pencil, which I highly recommend. In the past, I've used Sharpies in order to do this, and I have experienced bleeding with the Sharpies. So I do really recommend using a wax pencil or a piece of chalk instead in order to transfer your patterns onto the fabric so that you don't have to worry about anything bleeding through. When cutting out your patterns, there are a couple important things to always keep in mind when cutting fur. In order to save the fur end so that you don't destroy it, you do want to cut only through the backing of the fur, which can take a bit of a practice to get used to. And for edges like these, where the wrist and palm are going to connect, I want to make sure that the overlap is as clean as possible. So you'll notice that I kind of angle my scissors towards the furs, so that that way I get as close of a cut as possible on the edges. It's very important to maintain your fur edge in order to produce a very beautiful result, as well as help hide your seams. Oftentimes when you cut out pieces of fur like this, however, there will be a little bit of flyaways and stragglers that just kind of come loose on the cut edge. This is totally normal and it's nothing to panic about unless there's a lot of balding going on. I always preemptively brush out my little fur pieces when I do this because I think it makes everything a little bit cleaner and easier to sew together later on. Carefully cut out the remaining pieces of your fabric in each according color. The particular design that I'm doing here is a little bit complicated, so I have quite a few matching colors, and this black was especially troublesome. Most times whenever you do any sort of dark colors like this, you're going to find that you'll have difficulty tracing on the fur itself because it's so dark, you can't really use a dark colored pen. That's where this white wax pencil comes in extremely helpful because I can see my lines very clearly and it washes out, so that way I never have to worry about the color bleeding through. I used to use silver sharpies, which generally work, but to be on the safe side, I definitely recommend using some sort of chalk or wax pencil instead. Don't forget to mark all the individual pieces. I kind of made an oopsie poopsie here where I forgot to trace the top of the hand pattern, so uh, don't be like me, make sure you double check all the pattern pieces and you know exactly how many you need to cut out so that you don't have to unroll all of your stuff and redo it again, because I definitely had to do that and it was a bit of a pain in the butt, so learn from my experiences. <laughs> and then we begin the tedious and long process of cutting out and tracing all the individual fingers. It's a very laboring process to do this, but in the end it will make all the difference. 
For the fingers especially, you do want to give them a little bit more seam allowance than what you usually would do. So rather than, I want to say like one eighth is what I would usually do for most fingers. For these, I do tend to stick to one fourth because I want to make sure that I have just enough room on the outside for the seam edge, but that they're not going to end up too poofy and not fit with the shape of my fingers. A lot of little pieces all get traced at once. Cut out the raw shape, but don't cut out individual fingers because I'm going to show you a little trick here. When you have a bunch of really tiny pieces like this, specifically for areas like fingers or toes that you want to be extra short, there's a little trick you can do using your razor here. I have mine set to the lowest possible setting, but I do have the guard on so that that way I can not cut too, too hard through my fur here. And I'm just very carefully going to shave down the pile so that it's almost completely flat. This is already a very short fur. I think it's about one half inch pile. I believe it's a beaver fur. This is a very nice and smooth one, but for fingers especially, I really like them short for realistic hands to get as much detail as possible and to really show all the curves of the knuckles and stuff. So for this in particular, I go through and I make sure that I've shaved all the individual edges, brush out any flyaways, and then give it another pass over to make sure everything's nice and smooth. Shaving it all at once like this rather than individual fingers saves a lot of time. And it also makes it so that when you're cutting out these pieces, all of them will be the exact same length on the ends and you won't have to go through and retrim anything and end up with like weird fuzzies on the outsides. I believe Sock Eye Suits was the one whom I saw do this first and I absolutely love it. I've done it ever since. If for whatever reason, when you cut out your pieces, you have little strands or flyaways on here, you can just very carefully use your scissors to feather the edges out and make them all the same length. It's a super duper easy fix. Just don't forget to give them a little bit of a brush to claim any more loose bits. And then you have to begin the laborious process of doing this for every single finger, all 20 of them. Wowzers. Baringa, we are done. <laughs> I wish it didn't take 30 minutes to do this. Once you have all the pieces of the fabric cut out for your paws, you can lay them all out and make sure that you've counted all of them correctly and that every piece is lined up. The one thing I will note on the pattern as well is that it comes with these paw pads that you can transfer onto fabric if you do not have the following option, which I'll kind of take a second to explain. When you're making the paw pads, you want a generally stretchy material, such as this fabric here, which is called Mochi Minky. It has a very nice four-way stretch. It doesn't have a particular fur direction, so you can trace it any which way. But if you want something a little shinier, you can also go for a spandex material like this pretty opal one. Just bear in mind that the backing of this is very soft, so you're going to have to stabilize it. But you can also use fleece, because most fleece also has a little bit of a stretch. The important thing is to find a fabric that has a stretch if you're going to make the paw pads out of fabric. In my case, however, I'm going for the most realistic look possible, so I'm going to be using some beautiful silicone paw pads. I absolutely love the level of squish on these. They are extremely soft, which is generally preferred for me. I don't like the solid rubber ones because they're just very stiff. The backing I would prefer had to have been fleece or felt, but this material works just as well. The other thing you're going to have to consider are your claws. On the pattern, I've included a little template for a fabric claw if you want to use either vinyl or minky or whatever material of your choice. And if you want that extra little bit of like the flesh detailing that you often see coming out of animal claws for a more realistic look, you can cut out these little things, but it is totally optional. In my case, I specifically ordered these exact hex code color claws from the ever wonderful Dream Vision Creations. I love DVC stuff, and these claws in particular were a perfect match for me. I specifically ordered these ones that had the semi-translucent outside and the colored wick inside to match the character's like flesh tone color that I had for the particular head that I'm trying to match these paws to. And the color match is absolutely perfect. I love how realistic they look. They're not super duper sharp. The back is very smooth and soft, so that's also very nice. 
Once you have all your pattern pieces cut out and all your other materials are prepped, you can begin pinning and getting ready to sew all the pieces together. The more complex your design, obviously the longer that this process is going to take in order to pin and sew all the parts. This particular design that I'm working on has a moderately complex design with three colors, although I probably should have used a slightly different color for the bottom of the fingers, but you'll, you'll see in a minute um, the continuity errors that'll happen. And then I'm also going to be blanket stitching these shut so that I can lock the needle in place and be able to sew the wrist to the rest of the arm. On the pattern, I've also noted it so that if these two colors happen to be exactly the same, you can just go ahead and cut these pieces out connected and save yourself the seam. Now, when it comes to actually sewing these things, I want to take this second in the segment here to show how to properly thread a sewing needle when doing any kind of sewing work by hand. I've seen on Twitter recently that there's been quite a few people that were surprised that you're supposed to double thread and then tie the knot at the end of the thread, not single, but tying it to the needle itself, which I definitely was guilty of doing before I started learning how to make fursuits, and I'm genuinely surprised how many people are still doing it the other way, where you tie a single thread onto the needle. You should always double up your thread tie the tail at the end, and then double knot the end. Always, always double knot the end of the thread to prevent it from unraveling. Then to proceed with a blanket stitch, you're simply going to pierce through the fabric with the needle and pass it through its own loop at the end. This makes a secure connection so that it doesn't come undone when you're working on sewing the rest of your stitches together. To perform the blanket stitch, it's essentially going to be exactly what I just did. You pass the needle through both pieces of fabric that are pinched together, pass the needle through its own loop, and then pull it tight. The main thing to keep in mind here with blanket stitches is you want them to be very, very tightly packed together, and you want to keep them as consistently spaced as you physically can. The closer and more tightly packed your stitches will be, the better the end result and the stronger the connection. I also always hand sew using upholstery thread, but in some particular areas I prefer to use a little bit lighter of a thread because upholstery thread will be thick and tends to irritate your hand. Particularly on the thumb, I switched to using Guterman thread. I'm, I'm sure I butchered that name, but I recently started using this stuff because another maker friend of mine had recommended it, and oh my goodness, it is so worth the extra money that it costs because this thread is wonderfully soft and extremely strong. Much better than upholstery thread for tight areas. To end your thread when you're starting to run out, you're simply going to pass it through itself just as if you're tying a basic knot. I find it's easy to make a little loop, pass the needle through itself, and then pull it tight. Make sure that you do tie it off twice so that you do have a very secure connection and then once you've finished your chain, you want to stress your stitches. Intentionally pull on the fabric and make sure that there are no stitches that pop loose or that the fabric doesn't tear. If either the stitch pops or the fabric tears, you may need to go over these areas again and reinforce them because the connection was not secure enough. You can also help it lay flat a little bit easier by pressing down on the stitching to kind of flatten out the edge. Flip it over and give it a little brush to test and make sure how nice and smooth the connection should be. These two fabrics should look like they connect nice and smooth with no weird ridges or bumps in between them. This fabric is very nice and soft and the connection is so smooth that you almost can't even see where the wrist is connected to the rest of it, which turned out amazingly good. You can slide it over the top of your hand and check to make sure everything is lining up properly and that it's all in the right position and you shouldn't have to make any weird alterations on it. With this, we're ready to move on to the more complex part of this, which is going to be attaching all of the fingers. This process takes forever and I definitely recommend doing it one finger at a time in order to save yourself the stress because it... 
it, it can get very confusing and it's going to be difficult in order to go through each and every one of these fingers without getting lost or confused or just have a mash of clips everywhere on such a tiny little area. This project is something that I really recommend hand sewing everything because the machine tends to make too thick of a seam edge and it just won't lay quite as flat as the hand sewing will. It's more time consuming and definitely a lot more of a tedious process, but all in all, I think it produces a absolutely beautiful look and it's well worth the effort that you can pour into it. Working on all these individual fingers, however, you're going to uh, notice a little bit of a continuity error in a minute here because <laughs> It wasn't until after I sewed an entire hand's worth of fingers on that I looked at my pattern, I looked at my character reference sheet, and I went, oh gosh, oh darn, my fingertips on the bottom side are supposed to be black like the rest of the wrist. They're not supposed to be white. Fantastic. So I had to seam rip all my individual parts and retrace them with the correct color of the fabric and then re-sew them all again, and it was a pain in the butt. But that explains why there's a bit of a continuity error here when I stress the seam and I'm like, yeah, look, this is beautiful. You know, I brushed out all my fluff. I love how my hand looks. The fingers are so nice and clean. I was really happy with how it was looking. And then there comes the moment right here where my brain went, oh, that's the wrong color. Lovely, I have to do this again. So. There, there's the, <laughs> there's the fixed version. I've now finished sewing together all the hands, all the fingers, all those nice clean stitches that are all laid out together. And once you reach this stage, you can flip the paws over and attach both the top and bottom halves together. It's very important at this stage to make sure that everything lines up nice and cleanly especially because this pattern is kind of weird. The top half is wider than the bottom half because I wanted it to contour to the hand more realistically and I wanted it to have a very nice wraparound shape. So it does get a little funky to pin. Definitely use your seam edges to kind of make sure that everything stays even and doesn't get like all funky and weird and warped. And if you see how I'm pinning these edges here by slowly turning and stuffing the fur inside each one of the fingers, that's the way that you want to try and do this. It will produce a much smoother result and there will be less likely to have warping. Any kind of small details like this is always going to be a bit of a challenge to do and it's definitely something that I encourage you to take your time with and do not rush because especially in this spot here, having to hand sew these entire edges took so long, but it's more than worth it in the end if you just take your time with it and try to color match your thread. Anytime you're hand sewing anything, it's very likely that you're going to see the thread through the fabric. It's just, it's almost inevitable. So try and color match as much as you can when you're working through your fingers and stuff like this. Being able to work through each individual piece, tie off your threads securely so that we don't have any pop seams that'll happen, especially around the fingers and particularly the joints in between each of the fingers, because these are the areas that are gonna be under the most stress between you putting the paws on and off, as well as just generally trying the wear and tear of moving them around with all of the motion and your hands and sweat and grime and friction and just this area will get worn down very very quickly and it will definitely get looser over time. Once you finish sewing one together it should look kind of like a very funky looking glove. The fingers will be very very snug but turning them inside out shouldn't be too much of a challenge if you have a relatively short fibered fabric on them. I find by poking like a little hole into the tip of the finger and then using a blunt long object such as the end of the Sharpie here, I can kind of guide the finger into the channel in order to turn it inside out. 
I'm just using very minimal amounts of pressure here as I'm doing this because you don't wanna to push too hard. You can actually rupture the fabric and break through your stitching if you're not careful. So be gentle, but be firm. You're gonna to have to put a little bit of elbow grease into getting these tiny little areas to go through one another. And then for turning the whole hand inside out, I find it's easiest to use both hands and kind of roll the fabric into itself until the end of the hand eventually emerges. Then just straighten out the fingers and take a look at your handiwork. Overall, I was pretty satisfied with this first initial result. I've only tested this pattern once prior, so there was a lot of editing and tweaks that I had to do before I was able to list the pattern for sale. But upon finishing these, I was really pleased with them. I really like how the short fibered fur looks. It retains just an absolutely stunning amount of detail. It looks really realistic. It's still super dexterous. And they're so slim and teeny tiny that I can fold them up and stick them in my fursuit head when I travel anywhere. Initially, once you do finish sewing it together and turning it inside out, you want to try it on for a test fit and see if there's any areas that you may need to go back and alter. Sometimes the finger may be too tight on a connection joint and you'll need to add a little swatch of fabric to widen it, or it may be just way too big and you'll have to reduce the fabric in some areas to make it fit your hand better. I had this weird fluff where it just didn't quite match the inside of the hand. So I took my little razor here and I very carefully trimmed the edges, just eyeballing it as best I could to make sure that everything looked nice and clean and proper. The wrist did look a little bit funky and fluffy and there were some random little flyaways on the tips of the fingers. So I just used the clippers in order to trim all that up and make sure that everything looked nice and clean. This step is definitely optional, but I find it does make a big difference if you have it on because then you're able to see how the shape fills out and eyeball what areas need a little bit of modification. I didn't really like how scrunchy the fabric got around my hand right there, so I tried to use the clippers in order to trim that area down just a little bit, try to make it a little bit smoother of a transition between the two. When it comes to any sort of super detailed project like this, you're definitely gonna have to eyeball and go back and forth a lot in order to get a consistent look for what you're after. I, I think I finished these within 24 hours. So pretty good turnaround time for pause considering usually it takes me like two, three days. I'm definitely getting better with more practice, which is bonkers because at some point I need to go through and redo my puffy paw tutorial because it's awful and I really need to make a new version of it that's way better so after a little bit of trimming and modifications to the hands in order to make them fit a little bit more snug I gave it another test moving it around and trying to stress out and move my fingers as well as looking how the markings lined up and seeing if there was anything I would change in the future Particularly with a thumb like this, uh, next time I'm going to divide the bottom half in half in order to make it wrap around a little bit more naturally and not quite look as funky on the underside. But for this time, I think it turned out pretty good. I'm really happy with the shape and I think it comes across exactly like how I wanted. This is why it's very important to just test fit things. Once you're satisfied with how the actual appearance and the movement is, we're ready to attach the paw pads. Now, in my case, I'm using the silicone paw pad, but if you're going to be using the fabric ones, it's pretty much the exact same process. The only difference is that obviously mine are silicone, and if you're using a fabric paw pad, then yours will be fabric. But attaching them will be exactly the same. The method that we're going to use to attach these is called applique. And with silicone paw pads in particular, you're going to have to trim off any excess material, such as this stuff right here that I'm cleaning around the edge. You do not need this material when it comes to a hand paw, you just want the actual silicone bean. But the very important thing to keep in mind is that you need a good adhesive in order to do this. Because I learned the hard way, nothing will stick to silicone except silicone, and it will only stick when it is in an uncured state. 
So for this little bean here, I'm going to kind of leave an imprint in the paw so that I can figure out where exactly it needs to go, making a little impression. And then I'm gently going to carve away some of the fabric here so that it lays as flat on the palm as possible. You want to preserve as much of the raw edge as possible over here for where the actual base of the paw pad is so that the fibers kind of connect more naturally. But the less floof you have in this area where you're going to be gluing it down, the better. I definitely had to go back and fix a couple of the fingertips because I did not do this and it caused a little bit of problem later on. So learn from my experience, make sure that your connection point is as flat as possible. Once you've got it prepped and it's ready to go, we're going to attach the material with E6000. Now, big fat disclaimer warning. This material is incredibly toxic. The fumes it emits are carcinogens. They will make you extremely sick. Please, please, please make sure you are working in a well-ventilated area and you are wearing a mask or respirator in order to ventilate the fumes. Got it? Good. Once you're properly equipped with your personal protective equipment, we can go ahead and apply this E6000 adhesive on the back of the paw pads all over to make sure that it's a nice thin layer, but that it's going to have a nice secure grip carefully navigate the paw pad into place and set it down. This material is finicky to work with, but th this particular portion is gonna look hilarious. I really want to make sure this connection is as secure as possible. So once I have the bean in position, I clamp it down as tight as possible until I start to see the bean squish. When the bean squishes, I know I have it firmly clamped and then it's just a matter of waiting. The E6000 will set in roughly 15 minutes. So just clamp it, go take a break, get something to drink, get some fresh air, stretch, just leave it alone until it's fully dried. In about 15 minutes, you can come back and release your clamps and check to make sure that everything has securely glued down. The reason why we wanna use E6000 on this portion rather than using something like say, hot glue is because E6000 is a flexible adhesive. So in order to wear a glove like this and move it around, you do want to use the flexible adhesives in order to retain the movement without sacrificing too much of the dexterity. Then it's just a matter of going through and repeating this process with every other little bean that you have. These paws have five fingers, so I have 10 beans that I need to glue down and I generally save the thumb for last, which I'll explain in a minute why I do this. But going through, trimming each one, gluing them and clamping them, and then letting them fully sit and rest until they're dried. I then come back a little bit later, unclamp everything, check and make sure, and give it a good look. Now, it looks fine looking at it here, but when I test fit it and wiggled my fingers around, I noticed that a couple of my beans were ever so slightly off and that some of the fingers were just a little bit too poofy for what I wanted. So I ended up coming in and trimming the edges a little bit more to clean them up before attaching the thumb bean, which I always test where it's going to go by putting it on my hand first and making a little impression. And then I just use my scissors to very carefully carve a hard edge onto the fur so that I know exactly where it needs to go before I remove it, apply the glue, and then stick the bean down, clamp it, and let it dry. I prefer doing it this way because I find it just produces a much cleaner result. As time consuming as it is, it, I think it retains more dexterity doing it this way, and it looks much more organic especially if you don't have a different colored hand like I do. The top and the bottom are different, so it's very easy for me to see where the two halves of the pattern are. This particular paw, I also decided to add like an additional little do pad on it. I, I'm certain there's a name for this, and if there is, I'll, I'll put it on screen so that you can see what it's actually called. 
but I had these leftover silicone beans that were a very close color, but not exactly the same match from an old project back in, I wanna say 2018 that I did. And I had extras left over, so I decided to just use these extras in order to add another layer of detail onto these paws. And it worked out really, really nicely. They were the same firmness, so everything looked very similar. It had the same amount of squish on it, and it just turned out super detailed and pretty. Once everything is glued down, you want to give it a test fit and wiggle it around. Check and make sure everything looks good and that you can still move all your fingers without anything getting too in the way. You should be able to ball up your hand in a fist as well as make hand gestures fairly easily here. Because these are so nice and tight fit to your hands, it's honestly looking really great, but I feel I need to add the final touches to these lovely squish beans, which are going to be the beautiful custom colored claws that I got from Dream Vision Creations. When attaching any kind of claws, the very first thing that you're gonna need to do is go ahead and prep the edge of the hand. To do this, I generally look for the center of every finger and I'm very gently going to snip a tiny little spot right in the front here. This is only about a centimeter or two in length, so it's extremely small right at the tip of the finger. And don't worry about the fact that we're technically cutting through some of our stitching because we're going to seal the ends of these loose threads in a little bit once the claws are installed. I'm sure there's probably a much more defined way of doing this, but Sometimes my fingers rotate when I'm finishing stuff, so I want to just make sure I know exactly where all the parts are going. Marking the thumb with the scissors and then taking it off before cutting so that I don't accidentally snip my own little finger. Pulling any flyaways loose. Then we can go ahead and grab the claw. And there's a couple important things to note when it comes to claws like this. One, always make sure that the claw has a divot between the base and the claw. This is the part that's going to make it secure when we insert it. And the smoother the base, the better. You generally want to make sure that the connection point is round. I've got 3D printed claws before that have square bases and I've had to carve them down into a more rounded shape. So definitely make sure it's a round shape on the end for the attachment, not a square one. Shimmy it all the way up through the top of the finger and make it so that the edge of the claw just barely protrudes from that little slit that you cut. It should be very nice and snug, and there shouldn't be any weird stitches that are gonna pop out. You'll definitely have to futz with these in order to get them down into the middle, especially when you get closer to the smaller edges of the fingers, such as the pinky or even the ring finger, maybe a little smaller. I could have used a Dremel in order to sand down the edges of the pinky finger in order to make it sit a little bit more flush and not be quite as bulbous, but I think it worked pretty good for this initial one. Once you get all the claws inserted, you can put the paw on and kind of wiggle and move the claws around until they roughly get into the correct direction or position. If there's any weird flyaways, you can trim those off now reposition the claws as needed so that they're all facing the correct direction because they will definitely attempt to rotate from all the the scooshing that you did. Overall, I got these pretty straight on my first try and I absolutely love the silhouette that these get. They look so cool. I absolutely love them and I will definitely be making more paws like this in the future. They have just such a cool effect. I I love how the sharp, realistic claws, especially with the semi-translucent, adds so much to these. And it's, it's just, it's so cool. Even, <laughs> even editing this footage and seeing it play back as I'm watching it all reappear, I'm remembering look when I was looking at these, finishing these little portions, going, wow, these are really, really cool. And I absolutely love them. I want to make so many more of these. But yeah, just kind of position all your claws, make sure they all line up straight and that they're all the right kind of curvature that you can move your hand and it looks natural. Once you're 
generally happy with how it looks, we can move into the final stages of these, which are going to be securing the claws in place using some of the E6000. You just want to get a little bit of a bead on the end of the nozzle and very carefully run it along the edge of the claw, right where the fabric is, just on the part that we snipped particularly. This will both seal the loose end of the thread and it will, it will form a secure connection between the claw and the fabric of the hand. This is also one of the main reasons why I personally prefer to attach the claws after everything has been sewn together because I've done it the reverse way and it just doesn't look right. It looks funky and unnatural. The final step to finishing these is to add the cuff at the end. You can use bias tape if you want to. I personally prefer to use a strip of minky that I sew together because it's softer on my sensitive skin and it generally just looks prettier. Measure the circumference of your arm where the end of the paw will rest. For me, it's the end of my forearm near my elbow, measures about 10 inches. Cut a strip of fabric that's about 10 inches long or however much your circumference is. Fold the two halves together and then sew them. Once the parts are completely sewn together, you simply put it inside out over the edge of the cuff. I like to make the seam edge on the underside of my wrist because people are less likely to see that portion, so it kind of hides it a little bit nicer. Line up everything on the edge and then very carefully pin along the exterior. You'll definitely have to move the fabric around and kind of fiddle with it in order to get everything into position. I generally make these cuffs a little bit tighter than they need to be because I find that they loosen over time with taking them on and off and on and off and on and off. So take your time, pin them, make sure everything stays in place, and then use a straight stitch to very carefully sew along the edge. You can technically do this by hand using a blanket stitch, but I find the machine just makes a far more secure and pretty edge. So I prefer to be a little risky here and use my machine. This footage is sped up a lot, so I am going so slow when I'm doing this. Please do not rush this portion because you can very easily run your finger over if you're not careful. Trim any weird excess bits off of the edge, and then we're going to simply fold it in half. And then that half is going to get folded over the raw edge of the fur inside the paw. Pin this down once it's nice and lined up and then repeat all the way along the other side. I find it's helpful to do like the bottom and then the top and then slowly work your way across the sides in order to get everything pinned nice and symmetrical and have a nice even clean cuffed edge. The main reason why we add this cuff or bias tape to the end of a paw is because it prevents the material from stretching faster. It will definitely stretch over time the more that you do it but this will greatly reduce the amount of stretch that will happen to the edge so that these stay nice and snug and conform to your body. Very, very carefully sew along this edge to make sure that it defines and binds the end of the fur with this cuff that we're adding onto it. Using a straight stitch generally tends to work fine for me here. You can use a running stitch if you're doing this by hand but definitely make sure your stitches are packed as close together as you physically can get them if you want to have a nice clean finished edge. Once you've finished, you can cut out all the little flyaways and then just take your brush and very gently brush along the seam and it will kind of pull any fibers loose that are stuck in the seam edge and it hides it nice and smoothly and makes it look like it's one cohesive thing without like a weird machine sewn edge. It just looks more more natural, more clean, more professional. And it makes me generally happy to see the end result all come together like this. But if you followed along this far, you've got all your pieces sewn together, everything's been glued down and attached, your claws are installed, and your cuff has been added. These paws are finally finished and they are ready for their beautiful debut wherever you need to go.
is a tutorial that I really wanted to produce quite a while ago, and it's been entirely too long since I produced an actual tutorial for folks. There's videos on my channel where I, I tell people like, yeah, I'm going to be working on a tutorial real soon, so look out for it in the near future, and then a literal year goes by and that tutorial still has not come into the world. And that's on me. I... I have to be totally honest in that I have not been the best mentally. My mental and emotional state has been really exhausted and just drained, and I haven't had the creative drive to produce tutorials for a very long time. And that's not fair to all of you who sit through my videos and you watch them and you enjoy them. You like to learn things, and I like to teach and share that knowledge that I've invested time into. So my goal for this year is to do better and to try and stick to posting at least two full tutorials a month. That is my goal, and I'm going to try everything in my power to stick with it, even if they are smallish tutorials, things like doing, you know, how to make paw pads, how to make horns, how to make claws, just little things. I feel like I focus too much on the big things and that's why time gets away from me because th these videos are a daunting process. This one is going to be probably well over an hour by the time it's done and I probably spent I want to say close to 45 hours recording all the footage and working on everything. So it it adds up and I, I always try to stay under an hour for these big tutorials because in the past I've always felt that if I, if I go over an hour, nobody's going to watch the video. I think all of you have proved me wrong that time is not really a factor. You tend to enjoy the longer videos more, and that's very much similar to how I personally prefer videos. I would much rather look for a really long one that I can just put on and listen to in the background while I'm working, or I can pause throughout and kind of pace myself with, or maybe I'm just looking for a long video to put on while I'm trying to sleep and I just want something that has a general nice tone to it and there's not too many screams or shouts or anything like that. And from what I've read in my comment section, a lot of you seem to feel the same. So I'm going to try to make it a thing that I don't worry about how long the videos end up. I think I focused too much on that in the past, and that's why I haven't worked on tutorials as much. So I'm going to promise to do better, and I'm going to produce the kind of videos that you all look forward to and the things that you want to see. I'm going to try to post more frequently, and really prove to you all how much I appreciate your incredible amounts of support. From the people who watch my videos, those who like them, those who lurk, those who join in my live streams, and the people who support me on Patreon, and those who give absolutely incredible donations when I'm in lives, I am blown away by the amount of support that this channel and I have gotten. And it's it's an incredible thing to realize that as of September 2022, I have been fully self-employed. My artwork, my fursuits, and this channel are sustaining my future and my life. This is something that I was always told growing up would never be possible. That you can't make a living making art. That it's not a real job. But here I am. And it's thanks to all of you who support me and encourage me and just all your incredible positive comments that I see. You're the people that have encouraged me to keep trying, to keep pushing, and to continue bettering myself. I know if I keep going on at this rate, I'm going to ramble for another hour or so, but I feel like I could dedicate an entire video specifically to talking on a more personal level with all of you who follow my work. So I'll save that for another time. I'm also going to be reworking my Patreon and how I do the Patreon screen, as well as how the tiers and rewards and everything work. I just, I'm not satisfied 
with how I'm currently doing it. I feel like I'm doing it like every other YouTuber does, and I don't want to be every other YouTuber. I want to be Nefertiti, and I think that's a very important distinction to make in my life and how I produce content. So I'm, I'm going to be changing things up, hopefully for the better, and I will continue towards a better and brighter future. Thank you all so, so much for all of your support. Thank you for watching this video all the way through. And if you've made it all the way through this end screen to hear my little message to all of you, I just want to see who actually does sit through these videos. Include a purple heart emoji in your comment if you should choose to leave one. But with that, I want to wish you an absolutely wonderful day and a fantastic life. Oopsie, oopsie, I had to make a new, a new pattern piece because I fucked one up.